Welcome to Worship with Followers. You know, they say that humility is a tricky proposition. The truth is an interesting balancing act. We need to be people who recognize that we're not worthy of the mercy of our God. We can never deserve His grace. And yet, we're people who are so valued by our God that He designed a plan to save us and calls us His friends. He elevates us. Rick says, Next to love, humility seems to be the virtue prized most by Jesus, but it's widely misunderstood and doesn't come easily for any of us. So let's focus on the full meaning of that character trait, how it's a gift from God, and the ways in which it can bless both us and those around us when we exercise our humility ability. We're starting a little bit differently today, but we're not going backwards. I'm sharing a verse from Proverbs 22 that is more of a recipe than a promise. It's about giving and says, True humility and fear of the Lord lead to riches, honor, and long life. Now, this is not so much a promise from God, but a recipe from God's people. When we learn and model that appropriate awe and humility toward God, we will be blessed. Let's begin with a little attitude adjustment time, otherwise known as prayer. Dear Father, we come to you today to ask that you forgive the arrogance and foolish pride that we so often show others. Help us to not be so influenced by those around us and instead strive to be more like you, gentle, kind and humble in spite of being the creator of the world. Protect us from wanting the attention of this world or from being discouraged by the criticism offered from those nearby. Help us welcome friendship with you and membership in your family without thinking too highly of ourselves instead of the giver of those gifts. May we always remember that your love for everyone in this world is as great as it is for us, and we should regard others as your precious belongings. Put your word in our hearts, Lord, so that we may be blessed with your promise that if we humble ourselves under your power, you will lift us up in honor. Amen. We are saved, but only through his mercy. We are blessed, but only because of God's grace to us. We have the church because Jesus died for it. We have a comforter because our Savior left him with us as a gift. We are strong, but only because he raises us up. All the good things in our lives come from the Lord. And when we start to think that we're buddies or equals, just because our brother Jesus calls us friends, we need to keep it in perspective. It's all Him. Seated above, enthroned in the Father's love. Destined to die, poured out for all mankind. God's only Son, perfect and spotless one. He never sinned, but suffered as if he did. Yeah.
Christ shall come and we're out of acclamation and take me home what joy shall fill my heart then I shall bow in humble adoration I'm there proclaiming my God how great thou art
my portion this heart is overflowing my god and my savior your Today is a humility medley from Psalms and Proverbs. O Lord, our Lord, your majestic name fills the earth. Your glory is higher than the heavens. When I look at the night sky and see the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars you set in place, what are mere mortals that you should think about them or care for us? Yet you made them only a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. You gave them charge of everything you made. Lord, my heart is not proud. I don't concern myself with matters too great or too awesome for me to grasp. Instead, I have calmed and quieted myself like a weaned child who no longer cries for its mother's milk. I put my hope in you, now and always. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and don't rely on your own understanding. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. But he detests the proud and they will surely be punished. Pride goes before destruction and arrogance before a fall. But you save those who are humble and humble those who are proud. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Oh, my soul, praise Him for He is your health and salvation. Come on, you And mercy shall daily 
wine today because a fungus grows on grapes. And when those grapes are pressed into juice, the fungus automatically ferments it into alcohol. So in places like Bordeaux, France, vintners have grown grapes in the same vineyards for more than 2,000 uninterrupted years. At stake is heritage, identity, and authenticity. So only wines made in this region can call themselves Bordeaux. It's a serious offense to put a false label on a bottle or put non-Bordeaux wine in a bottle with a genuine label. In fact, every one of the 600 million bottles sent from this region every year must be inspected and certified as genuine. Each bottle, each vessel, must be worthy of the name it bears. Each must uphold the reputation of the wine creator and the standards that haven't changed for millennia. And that's why communion reminds me of wine. Not just because the wine calls to mind the blood of Jesus shed on Calvary to take away our sins, or because it complements the unleavened bread that symbolizes the broken and tortured body of Jesus. Wine reminds me of us. When we meet around the Lord's table, that, too, is about heritage, identity, and authenticity. It's a serious offense to call ourselves followers of Christ if that name is nothing more than a false label, or if what's inside us bears no resemblance to who and what we say we are. So when we share the bread and wine, it's an opportunity for us to be inspected and certified as genuine as we lay our hearts before God and ask Him to show us any impurities that must be removed. You should examine yourselves before eating the bread and drinking the cup, says the Apostle Paul. For if you eat the bread or drink the cup without honoring the body of Christ, you're eating and drinking God's judgment upon yourself. But if we would examine ourselves, we would not be judged by God in this way. In other words, we need to do a heart check during communion, 
to see where we are in our relationship with God, specifically what needs to change, and where we want to be with Him. Communion is a call to authenticity. After all, you must be worthy of the name you bear, and you must uphold the reputation of your Creator, meeting the standards that haven't changed for millennia. So truly commune with God, and the Lord's table will make you much more able to pour out your life before Him in a way that's real and rich, just like a fine wine. is what the Lord says. Don't let the wise boast in their wisdom, or the powerful boast in their power, or the rich boast in their riches. But those who wish to boast should boast in this alone, 
that they truly know me and understand that I am the Lord. And that's from Jeremiah 9, verses 23 and 24. So this week, do all things through Christ, but please remember who the strength in the partnership really is. Be blessed. And now here's Rick with his visual sermon called Humility Ability. Humility is the most elusive virtue because the minute you think you've got it, you've lost it. And the truth of the matter is, most of us spend way more time than we care to admit trying to make sure people like us, listen to us, respect us, and even admire us. Us, us, us. It's all about us. And that puts pressure on us in ways we seldom think about, sapping our peace, contentment, and sense of security. But God has a better way and wants to bless us with his humility ability. So let's get started. The term humility comes from the Latin word humilitus, which can be translated as humble or grounded or from the earth. It's thought the word humble comes from feudal England, where the lowest cuts of meat, those left over after the upper classes had taken their parts, were given to the lowest class of citizen. Those cuts were called humbles. So the idea is that humility allows others to go first. And the word is even more instructive in Hebrew. The Old Testament term for humility is anava, which literally means to stay within your bounds. The sense is that we should never overestimate ourselves or our abilities, which would mean going beyond what God has assigned us. But nor should we underestimate ourselves and what we can do, which would mean not using all of our God-given talents. So Anava is taking up the full amount of giftedness and influence that God has assigned us. That's what it means to be humble, to do all we can and use everything we have to glorify God. In the New Testament, the Greek word translated humility means lowliness of mind, going back to the idea of being grounded. So humility is an attitude of the heart, or a way of seeing ourselves, and not just an outward show. When Jesus was giving the Beatitudes in Matthew 5, he called that attitude being poor in spirit. And he said that those who were would be blessed and would inherit the kingdom of God. What he meant was that we must come before God recognizing that we're sinners and that we have nothing to offer to earn or deserve mercy and forgiveness. We're spiritual paupers who can't save ourselves. So all we can do is accept God's grace in humble gratitude and commit our lives to serving Him and His creatures. That means anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person, says Paul. The old life is gone, a new life has begun. And this is a gift from God, who brought us back to himself through Christ. For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin. So we must die to self and live in humility that puts others first. But that's a message that stands in stark contrast to the culture around us. We are surrounded by a me-first society that puts a very high value on self-centeredness and self-reliance. To see that, all you have to do is look at popular yeah. movies. Batman. I'm the boss. I am William Wallace. William Wallace is seven feet tall. Yes, I've heard. I just live by the ABCs. Adventurous, brave, creative. As you see, I've got biceps to spare. You are without doubt the worst pirate I've ever heard of. But you have heard of me. Control, control, you must run control. Yeah, the lack of humility before nature that's being displayed here um, staggers me. I'm gonna make him an offer again. I live alone, my swamp, me, nobody else, understand? You strike me as a particularly icy and remorseless man. Uh, no, I'm doing fine. I'm sure that's exactly what you want these people. I want to spend a little more time trying to do something with this. 
yourself in a little less time trying to impress me. It's not about you! No, it's not. It's about God and our response to Him. And yet we spend so much time and effort inflating our own importance until it blows up in our faces. Now, before we look at what humility should look like in our daily lives, let's be clear about what it's not. And for starters, it is not about weakness. It's about strength. And all we have to do to see that is to look at Jesus on the cross. He could have put himself first. Instead, he offered himself as a sacrifice for us. And that's humility, but it's not weakness. With the crucifixion in mind, Paul writes in Philippians 2, Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, and working together with one mind and purpose. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others, too. You must have the same attitude Jesus had. Though he was God, he didn't think equality with God was something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. Humbling himself in obedience to God, he died a criminal's death on a cross. So God elevated him to the place of highest honor. Dear friends, work hard to show the results of your salvation, obeying God with deep reverence and fear. For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases Him. So do everything without complaining and arguing, so no one can criticize you. Live clean, innocent lives as children of God, shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. Hold firmly to the word of life. All of that takes guts and gumption. Putting others first is not something for the lazy, the weak need, or the half-hearted. It takes commitment every day. And if you're wondering how to find that commitment, it's by remembering what Jesus did for you and then focusing on the things that he did. And in that regard... There's an interesting passage in John chapter 13 that we often overlook. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel round his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin, and began to wash his disciples' feet drying them with the towel that was wrapped round him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, You do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord Simon Peter replied, Not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, Those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you for he knew who was going to betray him. And that was why he said, not everyone was clean. 
When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. Did you catch it? The key is when John says, Jesus knew the Father had placed all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. Simply put, when you know God is in control, when you know where you came from, and when you know where you're going, you can wash feet. You can be a servant of all. And that begins in the church. Yes, all of you must be submissive to one another, writes Peter, and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. But what exactly does that mean, that God gives grace to the humble? Well, we normally think of grace as God's undeserved forgiveness and mercy, as we've already seen. But grace is also the ability that comes from God to lead the kind of life He wants us to. And He can only give us that ability if we're humble enough to accept it and not to think we already know it all and are everything we need to be. Remember what Paul said back in Philippians 2, God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases Him. That is grace, but we can only have it if we're humble. And God insists on that because humility brings peace and unity. So we have to make sure we're never so proud that we can't accept correction or constructive criticism or that we think our own opinions and preferences are always better than everybody else's. But even the 12 struggled with that, and things got ugly when two of them wanted to sit at the left and right hand of Jesus when he came into power. Father. When the ten heard about this, they were indignant with the two brothers. Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them? Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. True humility produces godliness, contentment, and security. It has nothing to do with weakness, and it doesn't mean we should always be putting ourselves down or dismissing our own talents and abilities. In fact, doing so is an insult to God, because those things come from Him. God has given each of you a talent from His great variety of spiritual gifts, Peter tells us. Use them well to serve one another. Do you have the gift of speaking? Then speak as though God Himself were speaking through you. Do you have the gift of helping others? Then do it with all the strength and energy God supplies. Then everything you do will bring glory to God through Jesus Christ. All glory and power to Him forever and ever. Amen. So the glory goes to God and not us. But don't belittle your giftedness from Him. Be useful with it. One of the best ways we can embrace humility is to avoid comparison and competition, especially when it comes to members of your own team in the church. So we can learn a lot from the example of former football star Jerome Bettis. Watch this and look for ways of applying his example to your own life, whether you're at work, at home, in the church, or wherever. He was the big brother that I never had. He's the guy that when I came into the league, kind of took me under his wing and was teaching me what it takes to be a leader. You can do that. You 
can't be cliquish, you know. You can't just hang out with all the black players at a table. You know, during lunch, go sit with the white guys. Go sit with the special teams. Go sit with the, the place kicker, the holder, the, the, the free agents, you know, the practice squad guys. That's what Jerome taught me. Bettis even welcomed those who could have taken his job. Hey, look this app, a little more patient. Acts like Richard Huntley, you know what I mean? Amos Zaraway. Do Staley. You get a chance to make the move inside of me, you go. And Willie Parker. I'm just an undrafted free agent. So when I met him, I just thought he was just going to look at me as like, uh, he's going to be gone. Like, he's just a jersey number. But he put value in me just from the start. He made me believe. He made me think I belong. And um, that's strong. Jerome Bettis was selfless. Jerome Bettis took less money. Jerome Bettis took less of a role late in his career. It was almost like the lesser role he accepted, the bigger the role he had in our team in terms of leadership. Well, I'll never forget the first day I was here. I was walking in, he was walking out, and you know, I saw him coming. I was like, holy cow, it's Jerome Bettis, you know? You got all excited as a, as a young guy. He walks right up to me, he's like, Ben, welcome. He opens my notebooks, I got both hands full. He writes Jerome on it, and he writes his number, and he says, anything I can ever help you with, I'm here for you. Don't hesitate to call. And to me, that meant a lot coming from a guy like Jerome. Hey, Ben, the beautiful thing about this, it's just football. <laughs> That's what's so beautiful, it's just football. Throughout Super Bowl week, Bettis had been the star attraction. But on game day, he took a supporting role behind new feature back, Willie show. Parker. Yeah. You gonna go in, you see them, they, they wall in that. I had talked to Willie about running this particular play and I wanted him to really think inside and not think outside. Based on his angle way coming in, you're not gonna be able to get outside of it. And I kind of ducked outside and came back inside full speed. I only seen like green grass. A Super Bowl record 75 yard scoring run. What? I owe that record to him. It parted like the Red Sea, baby. Good job, baby. The lessons for Christians be a team player, be secure in your own personality and abilities, put others first, and let our great and glorious coach call the shots. Don't think you're better than you really are, Paul warns. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves, measuring yourselves by the faith God has given us. Just as our bodies have many parts, and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body, the Church. We are many parts of one body, and we all belong to each other. In other words, we need each other, and we have to work together. As a well-known quote says, humility is not about thinking less of yourself, but about thinking of yourself less. So to be truly humble, find your worth in who you are, not in what you do. You're a child of God, and your value is in identity, not ability. Second, be secure in whatever God has blessed you with without feeling jealous or envious of what others have or do. Third, remember that the success of others does nothing to diminish your worth or your contribution. Number four, resist false humility by never putting yourself down just so people will tell you how wonderful you are. Number five, bring out the best in others by listening to them encouraging them, and helping them find opportunities to serve and shine, even if they outshine you. 6. Be open to new ideas and perspectives, recognizing you don't know it all. And most important, focus on the incomprehensible glory and grandeur of God, not to feel insignificant but to find your place among other believers as we do what we can together to honor and glorify Him. 
So, since God chose you to be the holy people He loves, you must clothe yourselves with tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. And whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through Him to God the Father. And remember, faithful Christians put on humility, but they don't put it on. Have a blessed week, everybody.